Hey, and uh, welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to talk briefly about SQL performance and Oracle performance metrics and constructs in general. As many of you know, uh, my last job was that of Chief Technical Officer at uh, an online training and testing company. Our performance issues, not surprisingly, all focused on those questions and their associated answers for the certification exams. The training side of the house was all B file pointers and just external files uh, being referenced from within the database. So they never really gave us any trouble, but not surprisingly, those highly secured questions for the certification exams, as well as their associated answers, were, were always a hot spot in the database. And uh, by the way, no, we didn't give the Oracle certification exam. We focused primarily on allied health. Regardless, uh, how does one deal with hot spots or bottlenecks in a database? Um, it's tough, is the short answer. And clearly, the first place for us to start is by looking a little at the Oracle architecture. Before we, as the doctors, can cure a problem, we need to understand a little about anatomy and physiology. So let's start with a look at the Oracle architecture, and we'll keep it real, real high level. All right, uh, this is a schematic that I put together and excuse my lack of artistic ability, I have absolutely none, that uh, kind of diagrams the major components, particularly those that impact performance, with respect to the Oracle architecture. First thing to notice is the SGA, the System Global Area. This is that chunk of memory which has been devoted exclusively to the use by Oracle. Um, you, this is established via the SGA target parameter in the init.ora file and is set as you start up an instance. Uh, a special point here with respect to the SGA. I can't tell you how many people I've heard say, you know, I bought extra memory, I installed it, and still my performance issues continue. Well, if you didn't change your SGA target parameter to incorporate that additional memory, it is not being utilized by Oracle. So remember that uh, those two have to work together. All right. Uh, within that SGA, we really got four different working areas of memory. Uh, the before image journal or the read write buffers, the BIJ. Uh, the before image journal is where transactions are stored prior to your doing a commit, okay? Uh, the read-write processes wake up on a periodic basis and flush the contents of the before image journal to disk, but uh, only those that have been committed. The chase here is you have too much memory allocated to the BIJ, you're wasting uh, memory that could otherwise be utilized by the shared pool, and you have too little, and your write processes are busy colliding with one another on the controller all the time. So it's a balancing act. You've got to play with that one a little bit. Uh, the after image journal is really nothing more than a long script that you can run. Uh, let me give you the scenario that normally references this. That is, you run your daily backups every night at 3 o'clock. They run till 3.15. They run concurrently while your database is up and running. But then at 3.15, you're, you're basically at that time needing to script everything that goes forward for the balance of that day should you have a need to recover the database, um, an after image journal. That is, you, you get a catastrophic hardware failure at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. What do you do to recover your transactions between the close of uh, backup at 3.15 and that 2 o'clock catastrophic event? Well, you run the after image journal forward, and uh, you call it, that's actually called rolling forward, and um, it recreates all those transactions. 
Again, uh, balancing the size of that guy is important. The shared pool is every database administrator and every database designer's biggest concern. Uh, it's where SQL and PLSQL play all their games. And as such, it's where your users are competing for space and uh, don't want to get swapped out is the short answer. The large pool is where Oracle is operating its backup utilities as well, as well as its parallel processing utilities and functions. Quite frankly, I've always just taken the default and never modified it a single time. So, so there you go. Other things to consider with respect to Oracle performance, uh, really one is hardware oriented. That is, you get a single controller um, managing multiple disks, you've got a potential bottleneck. Uh, in today's world, uh, an array of disks is everybody's standard operating procedure. But remember, run those guys at RAID 1, not RAID 5, because RAID 5 is a lot of extra overhead. And, and <laughs> the controller itself and the, and the mirroring can become the bottleneck, and you don't want that to happen. So remember RAID 1 versus RAID 5. And finally, pooling of the connections. Um, Oracle spends a lot of time waking up to service a new connection. That spends a lot, a lot of time and a lot of resources. So make certain those connections stay open by the use of pooled connection sharing. And whatever 3GL you're using should have a mechanism for getting that done. So check that out and make sure you're utilizing that. Okay. Now that we've got a little background on Oracle architecture, we can start taking a look at some SQL impacts on that architecture. All right, um, now that we have a little bit of understanding of the architecture, we can start looking at some of the SQL and in particular, some of the objects available to you, some of the clauses available to you that can cripple that architecture. The first and foremost one is views. Views are nothing more than a named query. Uh, these things get stored off to the system table, so really they're nothing more than a named pointer to a select statement. They are only realized at the time of the actual select on that view name. Now, if, as in this first example here, we're pointing to a single table underlying the view name. In this case, I called it lazy coder, I think, or something like that. Uh, you're not really going to take a performance hit on that. The optimizer just queries down through the system table to determine that. In fact, you're looking at the underlying table, checks the statistics on that table, and makes an execution path determination based on that. Not a big problem. The second view here is more problematic to me. This thing can become part of a long-term problem. And the reason is it's because it's got aggregate functions in it. And aggregate functions need to do an order by to realize the group by. Well, all that's good other than and up until you use this view in creation of another view, which gets used in the creation of another view, as in our third example here which at this point is becoming a nightmare. And the optimizer, quite frankly, is going to throw its hands up and say, I'm just going to do a table scan, that is, read every row from every table involved, bring it all into memory, sort it out as necessary from the most nested down, and then work my way out. Um, unfortunately, if you've got 2 million rows in one of those tables, all your other users are going to be locked out because you've just taken up the entire shared pool. Uh, views are a bad idea. I do have one exception to views that I'm okay with, and those are what's known as a materialized view. The syntax is right there. It's real straightforward. And what's happening here is Oracle actually goes ahead and creates a table with the contents of that view in it, just as though you had defined that table. The reason these are sometimes okay is when they're used in association with a data warehousing environment. 
Data warehousing is typically a separate and distinct instance of Oracle running on a separate and distinct set of servers. And what's happening is they're used for reporting and analysis. So once a month or one, it's every period of whatever. You create a bunch of these materialized views and you pump them over into the warehouse and then all your analysts can pound on those rather than on your fully denormalized tables and they've got a lot better chance of success and they don't need to know SQL as well as you would to put those materialized views together. Win-win for everybody and they stay off of your OLAP or your transaction online application something. I, I, I can't even remember what it stands for anymore, but uh, OLAP just stands for a transaction-based database and you don't want those materialized views in there, but they make perfect sense to offload them to a data warehousing environment. Okay, next construct that I'm a big fan not of is synonyms. Uh, synonym is simply a name pointer to another database object. Uh, it's usually a name given to a view or a table and almost invariably they're used in association where you need to synchronize up two otherwise disparate databases. You know, your company just bought another company and the two databases haven't synced up yet. So you need to be able to pull stuff from the two environments and you want to make them look the same to a novice programmer. So you build a view in uh, database two and put a synonym on it, call it a public synonym that makes it look exactly like a parallel table in database one. What's the bad news? Again, the optimizer is simply going to throw its hands up in the air and go, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm going to throw full scans at both these tables. And again, you have blown the shared pool out of the water. And what you did to make things easier in the world, in fact, has locked up your database. Bad idea. Don't use public synonyms. You know what, guys? I'm looking here at the timer on my computer, and I don't think there's any way I'm going to finish this whole performance lecture under my 20-minute Udemy uh, max. As such, you know what I think we're going to do? We're going to split this lecture up into two. And I'm going to stop here, and then we'll start again from this point in the next lecture. I'll go ahead and split the resource materials as well as the scripts as well, but I think we'll only go with one quiz at the end of the two lectures, knowing that uh, really my intent all along was to have this as a single lecture, but I'm, I'm running a little long here, so I don't want to get in trouble with the Udemy folks. So we'll pick it up from here in the next lecture where we'll finish our discussion of performance.